You have answered for the mountains you have moved. For the questions you have settled, Lord, it's the least that I can do to serve you with my whole heart. And though I can't repay the debt of love I owe you, but I'll try to anyway. I owe you everything. I owe you all of me. My life, my breath, my praise, my worship, I give it as an offering. Oh, I could never do enough in exchange for all you've done. You have made me something out of nothing. I owe you everything. When I pray in expectation and your answer is to wait, helping me to be more patient, Lord, and to trust in you by faith. I know that you are working your purpose for my good, and those long-awaited blessings remind me as they should that I owe you everything. I owe you all of me. My life, my breath, my praise, my worship, I give it as an offering. Oh, I could never do enough in exchange for all you've done. You have made me something out of nothing. I owe you everything. And should I lose all my possessions and my world come tumbling down, my soul is safe in you and I know without a doubt that I owe you everything. I owe you all of me. My life, my breath, my praise, my worship, I give it as an offering. Oh, I could never do enough in exchange for all you've done. You have made me something out of nothing. Yes. I owe you everything. Oh, I could never do enough in exchange for all you've done. You have made me something out of nothing. Oh, you have made me something out of nothing. I owe you everything. Thank you, sweet sisters. Always love hearing you sing and uh, share and the sign as well. A blessing. And uh, to our people, I want to say thank you for your faithful prayers for all the church family uh, through the weddings, uh, through the funerals, through the special needs that everyone has, the way you've rallied around Brother Dave and Miss Stephanie. I keep her in prayer as she's uh, seen some improvement. We're hoping that will continue uh, onward, obviously, and with our with uh, little David and my mom. Thank you for the way you love them and pray for them. And there's some there's some families in our church, I think, with some situations, some health and otherwise, that are they're what we would call unspoken requests, and that they can't be publicized right now. But praying for God's grace with them. Well, it was a it was a blessing to receive. Communication uh, a few weeks ago from someone I never met, but as I've grown to appreciate and love him in Christ as my brother, Arnold Nelson, Brother Arnie, is adjunct professor of astronomy, if that's correct, at Pensacola Christian College, and uh, has uh, obviously through his, uh, his vocational uh, call there in ministry, uh, great insight and knowledge, but more importantly through Jesus Christ and the Word of God knowledge about celestial things and uh, so he told me that in 2017 he was in I believe it was Hopkinsville Kentucky uh, was at a church uh, there where the totality um, it came through and then uh, we talked and uh, it just worked out perfect and I want to ask you to come brother Nelson and come if you would right now and by the way when he when we get ready to do the PowerPoint we get ready to do the PowerPoint. We will leave a little bit of light on. We'll figure out which works best. That way the live stream will be able to catch it. Brother Jeremy, if you get that covered, okay. You got that covered. Brother Nelson, this time is yours. And if we can do anything to help you, Thank we'll you. add this. Thank you so much. The uh, heavens declare the glory of God. My students would like to turn me down rather than put volume on. But I'm going to turn this mic on. Yeah. Yourself off inadvertently. 
Yes, you're off. That's it. It should be green. Let's see if I can get that to work. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Um, so now I'm even louder. Um, the, um, but um, the moon is going uh, 2,300 miles an hour. And some of you got those lists of time. We had to do some uh, computations in working from uh, uh, Greenwich Mean Time to Central Standard Time and all kinds of things like that. But God has perfect timing. God is going to be on time, and he does everything right. We're going to look today at the beauty of God's design, at, at God's perfection, at God's excellence. And then we're going to look at the things about God's word that describes in a way that nobody could have known at this time. And science is has caught up, in a sense, with what God does in his word, God says in his word. And then we're going to look at what appears to be a conflict between the Bible and science. It's my belief it's a totally false thing, and we're going to look at it and, uh, and, and uh, consider it, talk about it. The... Uh, we're going to be describing that in, as in the way Bible, the uh, Bible talks about the, the seven sisters or the Pleiades. But right now, I just want to look at the uh, universe as a work of art, as what it does. And there's a, a picture that we can't put up here well on the screen. So Mr. Harrelson's going to be coming around with it. And the, um, I'd like you to look at it closely because it's not something you can look at from a distance. So Mr. Harrelson's going to be bringing that around and, and you'll see it up close. But the universe, as, as we look at it, it's just, uh, this is the Milky Way. As some of you are seeing it, some of you who have an extremely dark sky, you're seeing this kind of sight from here. We're inside the Milky Way, and we're going to come, we're going to talk about that later on. The, um, just going to go and, and simply talk about what an excellence we have in this. All of that is, is working together and we, we study it and we look at what the atoms are doing. And we look at all the things that are working together and uh, the fact that it fits together and it works together. God does everything right, everything with excellence. That red in there is a gas that's giving out light way out there in the universe and um, notice the surroundings there those are part of our own galaxy gives you a little idea we've got so many stars in our galaxy that a hundred children starting when they just born they wouldn't be able to count them all if they if we total up everybody's total on a adding machine before they died, they wouldn't be able to make it to count the stars just of our own Milky Way galaxy itself. And these are pictures, actually, we have some fabulous pictures that have been taken. Uh, you can, you're done? Okay. Um, Just want you to look at the beauty and the perfection. It's 
last one was taken with an infrared telescope. Even before the web, we were taking pictures in the infrared. Now, if I had a Rembrandt, or if I had a Van Gogh, that painting would be worth billions just because of the artist. And the painting that you looked at is made by the same artist. Don't you tell me that you're no good. I know the author. I know who made you, and he makes good. Now, it might be that God is working in your life, doing some things to make you even better. It might be the unique thing about you, as opposed to all these, the galaxy, our, our, uh, stars in the galaxy moving um, um, at, at a speed of 67,000 miles per hour, whether they like or not, they have to go at that speed. They're going, since creation, they've been going at that speed. You don't have to, and God, you can stand in the way of what God is doing. But I do know the artist, and I know that he made good. Then I want to look at the perfection of God's word. And we won't need that um, projector anymore, and we can bring the lights back up the, so people won't fall asleep here on me. But um, please look in your Bibles at Psalm 19. Psalm 19. The stars back in David's day, when he was out on the hillside taking care of the sheep, were exactly the same as the stars we have today. I, I know that because we can map the proper motion of the stars, that's the motion left or right, and, and figure out how much they would change. And God has put so much empty space in space. It's just unbelievable, the space in space. And as a result, things, even though uh, I, I said our, our sun is moving 67,000 miles per hour as it goes around the galaxy, the galaxy is so big that even in, uh, since David's day, it hasn't changed. So the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their speech is gone out. I'm sorry. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them has he set a tabernacle for the sun which is the bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. Now, uh, I've met some of you, and you seem to be really bright people, so this should be easy. I'd like you to imagine that you were the stars out here. And I'm going to try to understand what God says in the heavens declare the glory of God. Now, that declaration, we're just speaking of you as stars now, and that, that de declaration is coming in. And just a, a model of where that declaration is arriving, and it's coming in on the earth. So let's imagine that we got the Orion stars here in the, in the middle, and over here, we got the spring stars with Leo 
And over here we got the fall stars uh, with Pegasus. And day on to day, those stars are declaring the glory of God. We can, I, I had, uh, we, for when COVID, when we closed down for COVID, we sent our students home. And I had a student that went home to communist China. And I was teaching um, astronomy and the Bible inside communist China. Uh, she was going, we, we did a thing called backyard astronomy. And I did a, a, a audio that they went out in their backyards and listened to. And I was preaching into communist China. But uh, day unto day utter speech, night unto night showeth knowledge. There is nowhere where that message now, if you imagine now that you were the stars, you're shining in here, and that message comes as we go day unto day. It's uttering speech. Night unto night showeth knowledge. And there's no speech nor language. So she sent me back a tape of her voice saying, we are seeing the stars, so I can use that in my class. Uh, they're they're getting the the same message that it's the stars are so far away that there's no difference. Their line has gone out through the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. Now I want to do a little rabbit trail here because I think there's a important point to be made. Um, suppose you were out shopping this week and you ran into somebody and they said, wasn't that a fabulous message from Pastor Stanley on, on James? But they got his name wrong. Now, they might get other things wrong in conversation and you'll let them get away with it. They have their own opinion and you know, they can, you don't want to argue about everything you disagree on, but that one you would. They would be wrong, and you would point out that they are wrong. The difference between that discussion and others is that that is truth. His name is truth, and we always treat truth that way. We don't argue about somebody's name and say uh, it's, it's something that you can have your own opinion on. We don't say that somebody's bigoted and narrow-minded because they have to have this particular... It's truth. And this is truth. God wrote it. And because it's truth, we treat it that way. And it's not narrow-minded or bigoted to do that. It's just the way things are. Always we treat, see, we treat truth that way uh, just because of the nature. We have precious little truth. People will argue about whether two plus two is four. It, it, precious little truth, that could, but we always treat truth that way. And then I'd like you to consider... Uh, a thing that we have to be very careful about as Christians. I'm going to make a step now. I'm going to say, in them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. And I'm going to go back here and get a model of the Milky Way. And I'm going to suggest that the tabernacle for the sun is... This is a model of the Milky Way, and we're looking inside this Milky Way. I'm going to suggest that the tabernacle for the sun is in the Milky Way. Well, that's my belief, but it's not coming from the Word. What the Word says, in them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. That language, that truth that God wrote, spoke to people that didn't have the vaguest idea what... Uh, they might have used the Milky Way term for the, the blur we see in the sky, but they thought of it as a blur. Had no idea any of this. They, uh, but I'm, I'm making a suggestion, but be very careful. 
I've seen it happen many times. People think they know what God says, and they're giving their own interpret. That's different. That we have to weigh. That we have to consider. I can be wrong. I've been wrong many times. So watch what we do. I had a bunch of books in my library on the names of God, and they're all wrong because they were based on, on false information, and we, we tend to treat, because of the way we work with the Bible, uh, you know, we just read it and we know, and, and later God will teach science and, and he will catch up. But we, we treat it as truth. We can't do that with other books. We can't do that with what I'm going to tell you now. It's something you need to weigh and consider. But in looking at the, in them hath he t set a tabernacle for the sun, the Milky Way is made of stars. So when you look out at it, you see a blur, but there are uh, so many stars that they pile up their light, and you'll see them, see it best in the fall and in the, um, in the summer, in midsummer, and, and I'm sorry, I said fall, I, I meant you see it into the fall, but left over from summer. The winter and summer are the two times when you'll see that Milky Way best. And we're inside, so we look at this saucer shape, and it, it uh, goes completely around us. Now, the sun, um, you have to pay big money to a psychiatrist to find yourself. This is free. You are right there, uh, and, and uh, you can find yourself here. But we, with our sun, are, are part of this Milky Way, and we go around. Now, with that idea, we look at verse 5, which is the bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. This is some race, 67,000 miles per hour. And we're going to talk later about a problem that they have in, in evolution with that speed. But no question, the stars inside us are passing us. At 67,000 miles per hour, we're getting lapped. And outside us, we're passing those stars. And all this is happening, started in, in action at creation, and it's been falling doesn't take any energy to fall. And if you could throw a baseball fast enough, it would go in orbit around the Earth. That's what we do with satellites. The GPS that uh, found my way up here, uh, uh, there are three GPS satellites that do a triangulation on the little box in front of my car and figure out exactly where I am. The um, they're falling around, so they don't need it, any energy. And God knew that, and he put those stars, all of them. There are more stars in our Milky Way galaxy than there are seconds in the lives of 100 people. And all of them are going the right speed to fall around. Then, his goings forth is from the end of the heaven. 67,000 miles per hour, and this thing is so big that we've never made a lap. Around the other side, we don't know what it's like. We got a theory, because we've studied our side really well, and we got a theory about what's happened over there. But Bible know, the, in the, in, uh, God knows that... Um, his circuit from the ends of it. And then there's nothing hid from the heat thereof. My wife was a preschool teacher and she had uh, children in her class that would uh, lay down under the table with their feet sticking out one side and their hands sticking out the other side and say, can you find me teacher? I'm hiding teacher. But I don't think you have that problem. If the light goes out, and uh, nothing hid from the heat thereof, uh, the light from the sun is going to go out. And 
the infrared, it's a real exciting time now with the web. We're getting infrared energy. And that, that light is that's what we call heat in science. So that, uh, it just sends shivers down my spine when I think about what God wrote here. Uh, when, and, and it was, had to be communicated in words that could be perceived through time when we didn't know anything about it. Would you turn, please, to Job? Um, a challenge to Job in Job 38. And if you look at the map of the sky from tonight on the um, April evening sky, notice that it's um, 10 o'clock tonight, so um, you can use it for quite some period of time if you just look earlier each night. But tonight, uh, this would match with the sky at uh, 10 o'clock. Now look at Job 38, 31. Canst thou bide the sweet influences of Pleiades? First, introducing the map, it'd be better if I could print this on the inside of a beanie and you could wear it home because it goes into the page. So you notice the little X in the middle that says overhead? That's straight up. So and you see east and north and south, looks like it's upside down, but this is the way it would be if you held it up over your head. So these are the stars that you're going to see uh, tonight and a little earlier as we go through April. Got a, a deep university level lecture for you here. If you're really good with numbers and you maybe could count to 2,800. That's the number of stars you'd have in a, in a totally dark sky. Some of you have that around here. If you can see the Milky Way going up through uh, Orion there, the Milky Way, if you can see that, you can see about 2,800 stars. But you start counting those stars and you start from the brightest. When you get to one, this is my deep university lecture. When you get to one, that's Jupiter. So uh, you don't have to be really great with mathematics here. When you get to one, that's Jupiter. And you notice at 10 o'clock, it's just setting over there in the west. So we're going to refer to that um, as a planet when we talk about the sky tomorrow during the uh, eclipse. But it's out there and it it's fools you. Uh, it looks just like a star, and it's over there in the west. Now, right above it, so if you turn your star map so that west is on the bottom, just above it, you see the Pleiades. Now, we can't see that on campus because we have so much light pollution, but many of you can here, and you'll notice it. You just get to the, the brightest star in the sky, and then just above it, you'll see a little patch that looks like a tiny little dipper. Some people uh, call it the milk dipper. But those stars, if you do an image search on the computer, you'll get all different telescope exposures of the Pleiades, and you see in them Sweet influences. I mean, it, um, it, there are stars in the Pleiades. They're not six. People talk about the, the um, seven sisters. More likely five or six. Uh, but um, there's a story to explain that. But uh, I certainly don't want to get into that today. But the sweet influences of Pleiades show in all those pictures because you'll get different exposures at different times, and, and you'll see different amounts of that nebulosity that are part of the Pleiades. Well, nobody knew that until we invented telescopes and time exposures and all that sort of thing, but God knew. 
and he challenges us and he, uh, today with canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades. Then he says, can you loose the bands of Orion? Just over to our left now, if you look at this map, are the stars of Orion. There are three stars that make the belt of Orion, make it easy to find in the sky. The lower it gets, the harder it gets, but um, it's, it's visible all through the winter. We're coming to the end of the winter season now, so it's not as easy to find. But it's there in our skies still. Back in Job's day, it hasn't changed a bit. In fact, the special thing about Orion is after all the other constellations in the sky have changed, Orion will still look like Orion. That's because these stars are even farther away. If you notice the star uh, Betelgeuse, that's uh, up in the upper left-hand corner of Orion, that star, if we made the, the sun just an inch away from the earth. So if I put the earth here on my finger and the sun over on my, ouch, ooh, ooh, that's hot. Uh, the sun over here on my, on my thumb, just inch apart, and we marked off the scale. Um, so 93 million miles is an inch. That's what our scale is. When we got to Betelgeuse, that would be 500 miles. When we get to Rigel down there in the bottom corner, that would be 800 miles. So imagine why the sun's out, sun outshines them. We're just very, very close compared to those stars, but they're still shining to us. And the exciting thing from God's word is he challenges us, which can now loose the bands of Orion, and Orion is bound. The bound stars are would, on that scale now, with every inch that goes 93 million miles, the belt stars would be 1,400 miles away. Then he says, canst thou bring forth Maseroth in his season? Now, I believe that Maseroth means the, the stars of the zodiac, but we don't know for sure because I, I always like to weigh scripture with scripture. Because we're dealing with something here that God wrote, it's a tremendous tool on itself, a tremendous study that we can make uh, uh, weighing scripture on scripture. And this is the only place that, that word appears. But it, no question it means stars. And the stars of the zodiac, the stars, all the stars, period, are brought forth because we, with our earth, we've got this turn, turning that we do and um, I would guess that the speed here is about 700 miles an hour. Now, we had a policeman in, in here this, this morning. Don't um, try to argue with him about that. But we're, we're going about 700 miles an hour toward the east as the earth turns and we go around. But what brings forth Maseroth in the season is that 67,000 miles an hour thing that we do around the sun. And what allows that to happen is gravity. And what gravity is, when we look at it in physics, the best definition we have for gravity today is it's just an optical illusion that the four-dimensional universe we have width and height and depth and then the fourth dimension is time, and I can't draw that because I can't imagine it, but that in, there's distortion in time that gives the illusion of gravity. That's the best we can do with a physics definition today, and God knew that. And he says, canst thou bring forth Mazaroth in his season? I can't even understand it. God wants to know if I, if, if I can bring forth and then he goes on to canst thou guide Arcturus with his sons. And there's a really sad thing that's happened with Arcturus. Um, Arcturus, if you 
look on your star map over in the east. It's the brightest star over in the east tonight. And if you look at the almost overhead, there are stars of the Big Dipper. And if you take the handle of the Big Dipper, it makes kind of an arc, not of a, not a, not a uh, arc kind of arc, but a, a, a piece of a circle kind of arc. And it goes in out to Arcturus. And that star Arcturus has the greatest proper motion of any of the stars that Job could have referred to by name. And there's a lot of astronomers who are thinking that it's not from around here, that it's from some other galaxy and just to passing through. And there's some theories, but lots of, of, of it is just, now all the stars are moving fast, but we, we said that the sky would look to us just about like, it, to Job, just about like it did to us. Well, this is the greatest motion, and it would go about a half a, de uh, a, half a degree in a thousand years. So you can imagine back to Job's day. I don't think it's moved enough. I, I know Boötes, the constellation, it's, I know that pretty well. And I don't think I could pick up that small a change in the sky. So God says, canst thou guide Arcturus with his sons? And there's a, a packet of uh, stars called the Arcturus Swarm that is like Arcturus in the fact that it has that, that great proper motion. Well, here's the sad thing. Um, I, this is theory now, and be careful about theories. The um, if we were Arcturus, and people spent a lot more time under the stars, they would watch Arcturus, and it follows the Big Dipper, and the Big Dipper is represented through the years of Bear. So if you look at the name Arcturus, it means Bear Driver. Now, you've got experts on Bible translation, and they would know, they would be those who knew the Hebrew the best of anybody at that time. And they would be working on this translation. Now, if you know any Hebrew experts, you know they also know a little bit of Greek. And when you come to the star Arcturus, in the English, Arcturus means bear driver. And I'm thinking that they would know a little bit of Greek, but no astronomy. And for good reason. This is a case where, I, awful to talk like this as an astronomy teacher, but it was good not to know astronomy in that day because it was really astrology. The um, astronomers who were getting a lot of information about the stars were working on horoscopes. And until Kepler, who thought God's thoughts after him, that was really, so it would be good not to know astronomy in that day and age. But they totally missed. And uh, it, it's sad to see because our, all of this section is so exciting to an astronomer, but Arcturus has been lost, and that's too bad. Now, I promised I was also going to talk about what I believe is a false conflict between, between astronomy, with, between the Bible and science. Um, when I was Growing up, I went to a church where I was going to say whenever the church was unlocked, but it was never locked. Whenever somebody was in the church, we were one of those that were in it when the church. We um, had I had a little pin that said "perfect attendance in Sunday school," and um, 
I kept learning uh, Bible verses and um, the, but I didn't have anything inside my heart and went off to college. I didn't have the parental influence any, and the community influence, surprising what the community can do in making it good to be good, really. Um, uh, and um, I got away from that, got off in college, and I would love to argue with Christians. I'd find out somebody believed the Bible, and I'd argue about things. Uh, uh, one of my favorites was that battle that went on when time stood still, and I talked about the, the soldiers out there with the swords fighting, and they would go off at a tangent at a thousand miles an hour and fly off into the air, and it wouldn't be much of a battle anymore. I would love to argue about those things. But when I got off, I went to, to in pre-engineering up in a small college, um, the University of Wisconsin in Eau Claire. And after two years of that, I went to Madison. And my roommate, who'd been my drinking buddy and a fraternity buddy, and um, the um, got, down, got down to Madison, and he was a new creature. I mean, he um, you get to know roommates pretty well. <laughs> Sometimes it was too well, actually. But... Early in the morning, he had this joy I could not understand. I just, and I saw the change in him from the year before. And uh, he asked me to go to church with him, and I gave him the best excuse I had. I, um, I was working for an engineer, and I was doing drafting on Sunday. Uh, uh, we were doing, a, back in those days, they did pencil drawings, and he was, uh, approving buildings for the state and he'd make changes in their their drawing and send it back to them, changes that they had to make and so he'd, he'd work on them and give them to me and I'd work on those drawings on Sunday and I don't know, it seemed like just a, a, a few days or a few weeks after this that he came to me and said got to have you on Saturday I suspect, he, he did sailing, and I, I suspect that he had a buddy who wanted to sail with him on Sunday, and um, he uh, had to change my date, but I, I, I used that excuse with my friend, and I lost my excuse, and I went to a church, a much smaller church than this, but I saw that same joy that was so mysterious, and I so coveted. And finally, I was willing to take God's way and admit that I was a sinner and admit that I needed God's way. And it, um, it's a miraculous thing that God has done. Yes, Dr. John Moore was a professor at Michigan State University, and he taught evolution just like everybody else. He went to a neighborhood Bible study. and Somebody told him about Christ. I don't know how long it took, but he spoke to our uh, college uh, Sunday school class, and he was more sound on six 24-hour day creation than many Bible-believing preachers I've met over the years. But the difference was he had a creator. Please, please, please don't get the idea that astronomy is making these choices between creation and evolution. Hey, they don't have a creator. They're helpless. I mean, it's not one hand tied behind their back. They're, 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 all their hands are tied behind. They don't have a creator. And you really, I mean, it's... Um, they don't even like to talk about a handicap. They just can't do it. So we see these things that are supposed to be science, but if you would look at the uh, map that you have over on the back where it's a calendar-like and uh, what would be tomorrow or, or the next day, by the way, someone pointed out to me that that, uh, that West notation on the bottom there is uh, incorrect, but 
um, if we, that when God covers up the sun tomorrow, down and to the right of it, we'll see the planet Venus. Now, Venus, um, the Aaron Rodgers theory of evolution, <laughs> it, it, uh, uh, Venus is going backward. Now, you see that, and you might say, well, that speaks to God's creation rather than natural evolution. Because natural evolution, it's not that we'd like them all to go the same way. They get their energy from the initial uh, nebula, their, their initial nebulosity, and the initial Big Bang. They have to go the same way. So we got to get a story. And the story with Venus is it got hit by this... Um, object, Mars size object back when it was mushy and, um, and hit at a glancing blow so it turned it around to go backward. Now, that's not science, that's a story. And if you look when uh, these are, are shining just as brightly today but we can't go out and look at them because the air, the uh, nitrogen and the um, oxygen in the air, uh, those little molecules up there scatter the sunlight. So it's coming from all over the place. And it's brighter than the stars. But tomorrow, when God covers up the sun, you're going to see up to the up and to the left, you'll notice the planet Mercury. I don't think our eyes, our eyes are a miracle. They will adjust uh, the the sun is no more dangerous tomorrow than it is any other day. It's just that tomorrow, where 90% of the sun gets covered up by the moon, that system that God is, that we've been using every day to protect our eyes. We can't look at the sun because the eye closes down. That system can get fooled when you get 90% of the sun covered. Uh, it can get fooled and we can actually look that, that's what makes it dangerous tomorrow. So, and it's going to be covered for about four minutes. So, it takes about 15 minutes for your eyes to adjust to the darkness. Two things that have to happen. They, op they open the, and the diff chemical change in the back of your eye to switch from color vision to black and white. It takes some time. So, our eyes uh, try... When you, we know the eclipse is coming because you can look with your eclipse glasses at that crescent getting uh, skinnier and skinnier. Uh, try to look at dark things so you could start getting your eyes adjusted. And you might be able to see Mercury, but um, I, I know for sure you'll see Jupiter. That's farther up. So it's farther from the sun and it's up and to the left. You'll see Jupiter. Now, Jupiter, when we study it, it's giving out much more light than it gets from the sun. Now, you can't do that. So you say, well, it's younger. Um, and, of course, it is younger. But what you do is, in that one, we really don't have a good story yet. But something is happening there. And all the theories that have been proposed, we don't know. But we do know from science that it speaks to God's creation and a young Jupiter. Mercury, going back to the Aaron Rodgers theory of evolution, it got schmucked when it was still kind of mushy by an iron football. Bigger than Alabama. I mean, not the stadium at Alabama, the whole state of Alabama. And that Iron football is down there in the center, and it gives it a magnetic field. And it also makes the density much more than it should be from evolution. And that's, I'm sorry, that's the best we've got. Now, our galaxy that we talked about, 500,000 miles per hour with our sun, we have measured the velocity on these stars, and the inside ones 
and are going at such a speed that they, they aren't going fast enough. They would be sucked into the center. So obviously they find since God made them, but they can't do millions of years. So it speaks against evolution. The outside ones are going so fast that they would spin off into space. You try to get millions of years out of them, it just cannot be. So do we say God's creation? No. You know from the Bible how somebody comes to the creator God in a perfect way. Oh, I would love to think I was a good enough teacher that my students would get 100 on every test and they'd get A++ everybody. They aren't. They aren't, they can't, they aren't going to do that. People are made differently. But God has made a perfect opportunity. So no matter how smart they are, they're not going to use calculus and differential equations and they aren't going to use their telescopes and, and uh, they, it, it's not going to happen. God has a way to come to him that's fair to everybody. And so Dr. John Moore could come to God um, just hearing a, a, a witness of a Christian in the backyard in the neighborhood Bible study and a child can come to God if they're willing to make that step of faith. And that's a miracle. That is, that is, uh, only God could do that. But this explanation, dark matter, now there is evidence for dark matter, scientific evidence for dark matter, but in order to solve that speed problem in the stars, and we see it in all our galaxies, every one we can measure, we see that the, the, they're not stable. They, they, they could not last for millions of years. So we make a story. And dark matter um, had a uh, class, the, our International Planetarium Society met up in Chicago one year. And Chicago has a college that does nothing but teach the evolution of stars. The Cosmological Institute at the University of Chicago, that's all they do. So they had cutting edge experts from all over the world that were teaching there. And they spoke to us. And the person that invented dark energy, that's a, another story altogether. But he said about dark matter, we don't know what it is. We don't have the vaguest idea. Send us your students. They were a research institution. Send us your students so we can figure it out. And the explanation, the best explanation we have, if there's more dark matter, which is invisible, we haven't found it yet, we don't have any idea what it is, but it's there and allows for that kind of speed that's evidence. The science shows that there must be something else in order to let evolution happen, and that's dark matter. Then a bigger problem, we have distant galaxies. Now with the Hubble, it's been so exciting because we're learning so many new things about our universe, and we have distant galaxies that you look at them and they're accelerating. Imagine you're out on the freeway you turn off your engine and you speed up. That'd be great for energy conservation, but it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. The uh, dark energy is a story. We ha don't have, we, if, if, if you think dark matter is bad, we don't have any idea what dark energy is, but it's pulling the universe to explain these galaxies that are being pulled out. Now, be very careful about this because um, we're getting totally away from, from science here. We're getting totally away from the Bible. But scientifically and biblically, we know that we can see this acceleration. We can see this. Uh, there's a thing called Doppler effect. 
which we can measure on stars, and they're accelerating. God said there's about a dozen places in the Bible where he says he stretched out the heaven. He spread them out like a tent to dwell in. But this acceleration, I'm suggesting, and of course, something like this needs to be, we're getting away from, we're getting to a theory now. But I wonder if we might be actually looking back at the, that stretching out that God did. Uh, we're seeing in the Doppler effect the momentum. Once God stretches it out, it's going to still show the redshift, and that's, that's science now. We expect that redshift to be shown, but stretching it out to say that acceleration is from that, that's a different story altogether. So be careful about that. And then the Webb telescope, oh, it's been exciting. Now, it's frustrating because our, our sun is losing energy. Um, oh, if you, could, if you could duplicate what the sun is doing, you'd be a millionaire just like that. Uh, the, the sun is fusing energy. We can do it for a second in a hydrogen bomb, but hydrogen bombs are very uncomfortable around cities, and that's where we need the electricity and power plants. And we haven't learned how to do it yet, but God's doing it in all these stars. And he's doing it on a, on a regular basis. But it takes, in each second, there are five million tons of sun, of hydrogen, that's being fused to do helium. We only get a tiny bit of that sun. We'll notice it when it gets cut off tomorrow, but it's going all directions, all over. And five billion tons a second. Now, scientists know about that. And that's a massive deficit spending. That's worse than our government. That's massive deficit spending. And you better well come up with some new stars. So you'll hear so much talk in the, in the web when you see web pictures, so much talk about uh, the fact that we're looking, for, looking at new stars being born. But this is a, a real need on the part of scientists to explain the tremendous loss we're seeing everywhere in our universe. And then just recently, in the lives of some of you young people here, the Webb telescope has discovered the um, universe. It's kind of an embarrassing thing to me. Um, Bill Nye is supposed to represent science, did a debate on the creation evolution question, and he implied that we could tell the, the um, we could measure parallax of galaxies, and that's really embarrassing because we couldn't even come close, not even close. Um, the only measurement for distant galaxies, the only way we measure their distance is from evolution. And of course, the age obviously comes from evolution. And you take those two things, and we've got galaxies that have been discovered by the web that are older than the universe. And that's a problem. I'm sorry, you cannot have negative time. It just isn't happening. So that's bigger. I, I talked about some of these things with the planets that are, that are problems, and we just make a story. You don't make a story for this one. One of them has to be definitely wrong. And I know that both of them are wrong, but I only get to ask, God, I, got, I got the answer book here. But um, this is, and one of, but it, and in, over time, the scientists are not going to come to God because that takes a step of faith, just like you children have done. And they can do the same thing if they have the faith to do. But in their pride, they're not going to make it that way. So this is, this is serious. Let's pray.